Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining this discussion. I'm Ken Dykewald, the CEO of AgeWave, but today I'm going to be an interviewer. And I got the pleasure of interviewing my son, Zach Dykewald, about his new book, Young China, How the Restless Generation Will Change Their Country and the World. And if you'd like to know more about what Zach's doing, he has a website, youngchinagroup.com. And the book, Young China, is being sold in all the obvious places. Uh, it will be available for release in February 13. St. Martin's is the publisher. Uh, now let's jump into the discussion. Zach, first question. Um, why should we care about Young China? Before I get into this, I'm going to say hi to everyone. I am so pleased that everyone's joining us on the call today, and I'm thrilled to be here with my dad doing this very first interview. Now to the meat. Why should people care about Young China? Impact. Whether you like to watch movies or make movies, whether you are in the tech space making apps, whether you are interested in international politics or economics or local manufacturing, if you're selling soda, cell phones, or solar panels, this young generation is going to impact you personally. On top of that, they are utterly different than any generation that we've seen before. So you went off to China after uh, graduating college in 2012, and uh, you've written this book. You spent four years there. And what are you hoping to accomplish with this book? I'm hoping to help build a bridge of understanding. This young generation in China has spent a lot of their lives watching Western movies, Western TV shows, understanding our history, understanding our government, and coming from a genuine place of curiosity. My hope is that we want to learn from them as well. I think once you have that mutual understanding, that mutual interest, you're going to have a lot better relationships. By, you know, on the big scale, we're talking world peace, but on the small scale, just personal relationships. I hope to be a part of that bridge building process. So why did you decide to move to China in the first place? <laughs> Believe it or not, it started with science fiction. I wanted to go to China to see the future. When I was a kid, I was a voracious science fiction reader. Still am. I actually almost exclusively read Chinese science fiction at this point. I'm reading Santi right now, The Three-Body Problem. President Obama really liked it, so uh, check it out. But when I was deciding where to study abroad, uh, I was a junior at Columbia, and I was figuring I could go to France and study history, or I could go to China and see where everyone was saying the future was happening. When you set it up like that, it's a pretty easy choice. I went back, finished my senior year, and I was convinced, the more I thought about it, that you cannot understand China from, it was difficult to understand China from far away. It was difficult to understand it on a week-long business trip. It was difficult to understand China. And this young generation from a boardroom in Shanghai, you had to be in it, tasting the taste, smelling the smells, understanding people's fears, hopes, aspirations, ambitions, you know, the, the heartbeat of, of the generation. And I wanted to put myself in it. So you had this language to deal with, and you were never really good with languages. <laughs> Tell me, just because I'm not that expert on Chinese language, what, how, how does it work? Sure, there's two tough parts of the Chinese language. First, tens of thousands of characters, and second, it's a tonal language. Characters first. In the English language, we have 26 letters. Those letters don't mean anything. They stand for a sound. So D doesn't mean anything. It stands for D. Stuck together with two other letters, you can make dad. Our written language describes our spoken language. Chinese is different. If you don't understand a specific Chinese character, if you haven't memorized that character specifically, you cannot read it off the page and know what it means. So you have to memorize thousands of characters in order just to read a simple book or the newspaper. The next part is tones. There are four tones. So you know thousands of symbols now? Yes. I still study every day. It's a lifelong process. How many hours a day do you work at your Chinese? Uh, two hours, I would say, daily, sometimes still. more. Still. Hopefully more. But I, you know, a lot of the work I do, fortunately now, I get to do in Chinese. So everything I do is practice. I only watch Chinese TV. I only watch uh, Chinese movies, which makes me a really crappy dinner date. <laughs> but I, uh, it, it's something that I've committed myself to. The second part is the tone part, and that part's pretty interesting, particularly tone, for Westerners. Tone, you're saying tone part? There's four tones in Mandarin Chinese. So if you pitch your voice one of four different ways, a phoneme or a syllable can have an entirely different meaning. The classic example is ma, 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 ma. Ma means mother. Ma means hemp. 
Ma means horse. Ma means scold. You don't want to mix up horse and ma. It's a difficult language to master, and particularly for Westerners, but once you acclimate your ear, it's definitely possible. So you went there as a young guy. Uh, you couldn't speak the language. Uh, you didn't want to be an expat. Uh, you, uh, you had no money, and you didn't know people. What was it like? Hard. <laughs> it was hard, the first year especially, but it was also sort of supposed to be. The old generation in China, the old generation was known as the eat bitter generation. Chikhu means to eat bitter. It means to be able to withstand hardship and tough times for an extended period of time without the prospect of gratification. And that can mean delaying gratification for a year, it can mean 10 years, it can mean a, it can mean a generation. So even though young China has grown up in a better situation than this older generation, that ability to eat bitter is still in the genetics of what it means to be Chinese today. As a somewhat soft American kid, I wanted a bit of that. I wanted a bit of that grit. What was your apartment like? When, where, 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 tell us what it was like where you were living, what were you doing for yeah, a moment before so, we get into sort of the social, political, and marketplace things. Right. The well, first year I was in Suzhou, China, and, and I, as part of this language journey and trying to create an entirely Chinese mental diet to, to, help, with, to help with language, I only had Chinese roommates and we were all pretty broke. So that first winter, Suzhou gets below freezing, but there's no heat in southern cities in China. So when it was snowing outside, my roommates would leave the windows open because it wouldn't matter. There was no hot water in our apartment. Uh, I slept on a bed that was strips of bamboo woven together, kind of like an ultra taut hammock. I learned that that retains no heat. I'd sleep in a parka. I could see my breath forming above my face in the morning. But again, that was part of it. It wasn't exceptional. It was just what it means to be a young Chinese person trying to figure it out in the big city. And over these years, did you stay in Suzhou primarily, or did you wander? I traveled all around. I've actually been to all of the different provinces in China at this point. That first year alone, I spent, I've traveled thousands of years on train and Thousands of years. Excuse me, thousands of years. Uh, thousands of miles on Chinese trains all over the country. I would say also that when you go to these city centers. You go to the metropolis like Shanghai or Suzhou even, but then you start to move outside of the cities. It does feel like time travel. China has developed so fast that if you go 50 miles out of the city, you are looking at what China looked like in the 1990s. It's, it's a different experience than anything we have in the West. Were you comfortable? Uh, no, but, <laughs> uh, but again, that wasn't the point. All right, so your book is titled Young China, and you know, we're the age wave family, so young, young China, uh, millennials. How is young China, in your view, Zach, different than old China? There are four main points, four main key differences. The first is open-minded. The old generation in China grew up behind a wall. In Guizhou province, one of the inland poor provinces in China, I went there for my first Chinese New Year. My friend's parents used to be the most popular house in the village because they had a calendar hanging on the wall, 12 pictures, the fields of Europe. That was the view of the outside. This young generation has grown up with the internet. They've grown up being able to travel internationally. They've grown up with a view of the world that so far surpasses their parents. It's almost incomparable. It's an incomparable worldview. Second, capitalism. Isn't it ironic that the world's largest communist party created the largest capitalist miracle of the modern age? <laughs> the old generation grew up in poverty. As recently as 1990, the GDP per capita was under 200 bucks. What is it now? Uh, it's around 10,000. Wow. The way that this young generation has watched their country rise from rags to riches, it's incredible. All right, so when mom and I, our generation, we were going off to Woodstock, what was yeah. happening in China? So when around the same time you guys were going off to Woodstock, I know people and have spoken with people in China who were eating tree bark to, to fight off starvation. That was the reality in China. So these young people, you were born in 1990, let's say born in your era, have experienced this capitalistic success. Watched it with their own eyes. The third point is 421. In China right now, there are a lot of old people for a relatively few amount of young people. 
about 50 years ago, it used to be the opposite. There was a lot of young people, and people died young, so there wasn't a lot of old What was people. your life expectancy, let's say, 1950? 1950, the life expectancy was 36 years old, wow. and the average family was having about five to six kids. Now, with the one-child policy and an amazing longevity revolution in China, the life expectancy has doubled, and the amount of kids have, has dwindled to two to one per family. So you have four grandparents for two parents for one child, what's called the 4 to one problem. And the last point, and I think it's a really important point, is clout. If you were to ask a member of the older generation in China when they were younger, can China lead? Is China powerful? The answer would be no. This young generation, the answer would be yes. They expect their country to, believe, to, to lead. They expect their country to be powerful. Clout. I think I heard the president say something about rejuvenation or how is this clout manifest? In sure. This is an interesting, you know, right now there's what some of us call the construction of the Chinese soul, what it means to be Chinese in the modern era. Xi Jinping, the president of China, the word he uses is fu xing. Fu xing is a really interesting word because it means rejuvenation. It refers to a, a return to a place of prominence. It can also be translated as renaissance. This young generation is growing up in a country, in an, in an environment that is pushing the modern renaissance in China. This young generation is witness to that. They're a part of it. They're driving it. They're living it. And they're aspiring to be a major contributor to that. All right, so clout, capitalistic success, 421, um, and what was Open the other mindedness. one? Open-mindedness. Yeah. Are there so, any events that have occurred in the last 10, 20 years that, that have kind of sparked the kind of the excitement and the enthusiasm of the young generation that you could tell us about? Yeah, I'm going to rattle off a few quickly. The first is 2008 Beijing Olympics. It's known as China's coming out party. It was a moment where the world watched China do their opening ceremony, which, which is now known as the greatest performance in the history of mankind. The scale, the size, the coordination. To the rest of the world, it looked like you know, an amazing performance, a show of China's might and coordination. To China, it looked the same way, and it was a surprise. To this young generation watching their country perform at that level, unlike anything they'd ever seen. Second, in 2014, Jack Ma, the, the founder of Alibaba, came to New York, and his company had the largest IPO in the history at that time of the New York Stock Exchange. What was so interesting about that was that Jack Ma and Alibaba, they don't sell bricks. They're not making China. They are not... Uh, it's not a shirt conglomeration. It's an innovation company. At a time when the world was saying China's just a copycat nation, China's largest innovation company came and had the biggest historic IPO in, in the U.S. on the territory of the innovators. Third, last year Xi Jinping, the president of China, got up at, at, at the World Economic Forum and said, China is going to lead the world in, in, in trade. China is ready to lead the world in on free trade in, in a sort of capitalist sphere. For the rest, for the people watching in China, that's a type of leadership that they weren't used to coming from their country. And the last is Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road Initiative is really interesting. For those who don't know, Belt and Road Initiative is a massive infrastructure plan centered around China, but it includes 68 different countries currently in the Asia Extended region. Asia Extended means they're building a, a railway all the way to London. There are ports in Kenya. It's a massive swath of earth that they are covering. And what it does is it puts China at the center of a sort of hub and spoke wheel uh, of economic dependencies. So if any of these spokes break, if one of these trade deals with one of these countries falters, the wheel continues to turn. But if you take out the hub, if you take out China, the entire wheel collapses. What it says to the international community, but again, it's also speaking this message to the Chinese people and to young China, is that we are building, at a time when the US every four years looks like it's fluctuating, looks like they could tear up a trade deal, China is building its relationships in concrete and steel to last not every four years, but to last generations. Wow. All right, so it's got to be on everybody's mind. It's surely been on my mind. There's a lot of talk about millennials in America. Right. And, um, are Chinese millennials the same? I mean, are, they, are we talking about the same kind of energy? It's a really good question because 
everyone in the U.S. wants to talk to me about millennials. There's a lot to do about us, how to, how to sell to us, how to market to us, what, what are our politics. Just for scale here, there are 80 million millennials in the United States. There are 400 million millennials in China. That's five times as many, more than the entire population of the United States and Canada combined. Differentiators, competitive and hardworking. I'm competitive and hardworking. That's, you know, a lot of people have said that. What's, what's the big difference here? In China, the project of childhood is different. In the US, when we are, when a kid is going to football practice or cheerleading practice, when they're playing video games with their friends, uh, when they're doing sleepovers on the weekend, their peer in China is studying. They're working. The competition for a position in a high school, a position in college, uh, the job market, it's so fierce in China that these families and these kids feel like they have no choice but to be working. Mom and I came, one of the times we came to visit you in Suzhou, we met you at the library and you, were, you had a gal that you were friends with, I think her, her Western name was Bella. Yeah. How many hours a day would Bella study at the library? 10 to 12. How many days a week? Seven. She once asked me, what's a weekend? She knew, but didn't exist in her vocabulary. So she spent 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Was she working on a graduate degree? No. She was preparing for a test to allow her to enter into a master's program. There was about seven, or there was 700 people taking the same test. There was three positions. Okay, so young China, pretty hardworking, pretty competitive. Have you seen anything like that? You've been to five continents. You've studied and traveled all over the world. Have you seen that kind of hardworking energy anywhere else? The only time I saw it was at my college, and it was from the Chinese exchange students. <laughs> it just doesn't, it, it doesn't exist, at least on that scale. You could argue that Singapore and South Korea have similar study cultures, but the scale of China is unbelievable. The last point on, on what makes this young generation different is pride. It's sort of a touchy subject. I'm very proud to be an American. But we're at a moment in American history where people are, are voting on the idea of making America great again. This young generation feels like their country is becoming great now. They have, from where they sit, the best rags to riches story in the history of the world. You know, our American dream is sort of a rags to riches story. It's through hard work I, and, and our meritocracy or, you know, our, our sort of, our our system of government and economics, we could work hard and move forward. We could bring our family, we could advance our, our stake in life, our lot in life. In China, they feel like their rags to riches story is their entire country. They remember poverty, they remember rags, and they're watching their country ascend to relative riches at a pace and scale unmatched in history. They have a lot to be proud of. Wow. Um, so when you went over there, um, were there any American heroes or religious figures that sort of were icons in China. Yeah, I, you know, I thought that maybe JFK or Oprah or <laughs> someone you know, would, would get through the cultural wall. You never really know what's going to get through that wall. By the quick aside, the most, most heard or the first heard English Western song in China is Yesterday Once More by the Carpenters. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you honestly really have no idea what's going to make it through. <laughs> what was interesting, I remember uh, that first year in China, I would be walking around the supermarket, and I'd go into the stationary section, and one person's face was on eraser heads. It was on backpacks. It was on notebooks. And looking out at us from these eraser heads with his signature glasses and turtleneck was none other than Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs in China and Apple in China stands for aspiration and innovation. <clears throat> At a moment where China recognizes that if they don't innovate, their country will not be able to continue to ascend, where every child knows <clears throat> that if they're not able to create, if they're, not be able, if they're not able to aspire to be innovative in the way that Steve Jobs was, they might not be able to advance their lot in life. That uh, he represents innovation and aspiration to this young generation. Wow. By the way, he's been replaced by Jack Ma. Back yeah. of backpacks, notebooks, Jack yeah, Ma, no. the, cult of, the cult of Ma. Wow. Uh, so we've heard a lot about these young people, your generation in China, referred to as little emperors. They're spoiled. They got all these parents doting on them. 
They're getting luxuries like young people in China never had. Uh, what does it look like to you? It looks like the opposite, honestly. Why? For China's little emperors, heavy hangs the head that wears the crown. Let me explain. So I talked about the 4 to one demography. Four parents up top, uh, excuse me, four grandparents, two parents, one child. Imagine that as a funnel. When you're young, that looks like attention, that looks like affection, that looks like extra food. This young generation, this single child generation is known for obesity because they, you know, they're literally, that's the way of expressing love for Chinese grandparents. It's also a funnel for expectation, for attention, for scrutiny. And because of the fierce competition to get a job, to get into a good school in China, they have the expectation of the entire family weighing down on that one Give child. me an example. Okay, uh, when I was, my first year in Suzhou, I had a particularly humiliating job. It was fun, but it was, you know, I remember it was a year after I graduated, and I was wearing an all-purple jumpsuit and had a green turtle hand puppet on my head. I was teaching an English class to three- to six-year-olds. It was a mixture of a coding class uh, and a science class with English combined. There was about five kids in the class. They were adorable. They were great kids. You know, three- to six-year-olds are kind of the same anywhere. And... But at the back of the class, there's a glass wall. And behind that glass wall, excuse me, there were six kids. Behind that glass wall, there was 12 parents, 24 grandparents, bearing down on these kids, watching their every pound of the keyboard, watching them fiddle with a microscope, every single movement. At the end of the class, Zhang Guo, one of the, one of the kids, I heard him wailing from the side of the room, started to cry. I look over and his mom is drilling him in flashcards, words that we'd learned during the class. Amoeba, microscope, dolphin. He's six years old. I ask her, what's going on? I didn't, I didn't assign any homework. She says, about 12 years, about 11 to 10, 10 to 11 years, my kid is going to have to take the Gaokao. He's going to have to take the college entrance exam. I'm giving him a leg up. Pressure. Pressure is the word most often on the lips of young China. So let's turn to a couple of things. We're going to talk about challenges China faces, as seen from young China, mm -hmm. marketplace opportunities, and the government. All right? So we here in the West sort of come to our own, perhaps, wrong conclusions about what we think China's big challenges are. Right. From the point of view of young people in China, through your interpretation, what are the big challenges China faces moving forward? There's three major ones. Aging, the aging of the population. China's original development story could be told as a lot of hands doing a lot of work for cheap. The people who built China's manufacturing economy are China's baby boomers. I know you're, you're the baby boomer expert. There's 76 million baby boomers in the United States. There were 440 million wow. in China. We didn't hear about them because they were, it was a moment of poverty. This generation is getting older. The question what are they of, like as old people? Tough as nails. You know, they survived the Cultural Revolution. They survived the Great Leap Forward. They're tough. They're not complainers. They're active. But they're getting old, and there's not a lot of young people to be able to support them. Who will care for the old? It's a political question. It's an economic question. It's also a spiritual question. What do you mean? In China, there's no religion, but there's family. And this ability to be shaoshun, this ability to, that translates to filial piety. It's a bad translation because we never use that word. But to be good to your parents is akin to being a good person. This young generation is crippled by this terrible, this want to take care of their parents, coupled with a complete inability to do so. The second point, how to lead. You know, it's easy to be a supporting character on the world stage. China is now sort of being thrust onto the center stage to be a main character. It's not easy to take on a leadership role. It changes how everyone interacts with you. How will China lead? And the third, and this one's quite important because it's very personal to a lot of young people, China needs to transition from an imitative to an innovative economy. The old system worked. Their old economic system worked when they had a surplus of people. Now that there's relatively few young people, if they aren't able to innovate, to create, to create service jobs, if they're not able to create new apps, uh, if they're not able to make scientific innovations, they will not be able to support their entire economy, their aging economy. Wow. So trying to shift a culture, an ancient culture, in this young generation from imitative to innovative, yeah. 
tough assignment. Really tough assignment. What, um, let me ask you a question about, you mentioned the aging, so it's obviously something I've thought about a little bit. Uh, <laughs> what does China's retirement system look like? Yeah, what China, are they going to do with all these old people? China's traditional retirement system is their kids. It's called fan bo mo shi. It's the return and feed model. So mom and papa bird look after the baby bird until they're ready to leave the nest and create their own home, often a little bit later than we have in Western cultures. And then when the baby bird is grown up and the mom and papa bird get a little older, baby bird comes back to the nest and looks after his parents. That was really easy when there was five to six kids per family. And the average life expectancy was 36. People didn't age, they died. They didn't retire, they passed away. So now that there's only one child, when the one child policy began, there were protests all over the country. The protests were not, we want our reproductive rights. The protests were, who will care for the old? So China does not have a pension system or retirement infrastructure. They're working one out. It is China's, you know, I've been in business meetings um, I've been in government meetings in China with, with high-level government officials and then people from the private sector. This issue of aging, because it, it touches on so many aspects of the culture, economics, politics, everyone is paying attention to it. So there, you know, I, I would expect that the greatest innovations probably in your field, in the field of longevity, will have to come from China. Because if they do not innovate in this space, they will have major problems down the line. All right, let's totally switch our direction here. Okay. And thanks uh, for all this. Um, so I guess we imagine here in the States that our young people and our young technology people and our whiz kids are the leaders in innovation. Can you give me an example of Chinese innovation that many of us may not know about? There's one that you all should know about. It's called WeChat. Wei Xin. We Chat. WeChat. It's from Tencent. It was a company started in 2011. Tencent. It Ten cents a Chinese company. Okay. Tongshun. And it's sort of like Facebook, Instagram, but then Venmo, Apple Pay, Uber, StubHub, Groupon, Yelp, plus 15 of your favorite apps, and then some you've never heard about, rolled up into one mega app, and then a little bit better. Wow. There are 900 million users. Give me an example how it works. Okay. So like two weeks ago, I was in Chengdu uh, in central China, the gateway to the west, and I was going to treat some friends to dinner. Weiwei and a few friends, I owed them a meal. And so I created a group chat on WeChat, sent them all messages. Then I ended up calling Weiwei specifically because I wanted to get in touch. I still haven't left the app. I'm calling through the app. Then I ended up video calling her because I wanted to say hi to her parents. They used to invite me to dinner. I know them well. Uh, we all said hello. It was great. I still haven't left the app. Because I was choosing the place to eat, I looked up on the sort of Yelp equivalent on WeChat, found a place, sent it all over to them. I still haven't left the app. I call an Uber through the app, get in, we go to the restaurant. Do they have Uber there? It's Didi. It's called Didi Chuxian. Uh, Uber got beat out. So I get to the restaurant. We order entirely through the app. I'm looking at recommendations and also special deals. So they have Groupon-like features, and every restaurant has one. So I chose one through the app. While we're at dinner, we're all taking selfies. You know, we're all, we're, it has a very social function. We're sending it to our friend circle. Still haven't left the app. I ended up paying with the app. Uh, and then, because Weiwei, who had driven there, had drank a little bit too much, I, I ordered what's called a Dai Jia. It's a man who comes in on a scooter and drives your car and you back to your apartment so that you don't have to drink and drive. Think about that. I ended up scanning a bicycle on the side of the road, one of these Mo bikes. I pedal sort of tipsily back to my apartment where I was staying. And then I have a video call with my parents who are in California just waking up. That would up. be me. That would be you. I'm on mom. Yeah, me, you, and, you and mom. So we had about a 20-minute call that night. Totally, How much did that cost? Totally free. At no point in any moment of the entire night did I have to leave the app. It's a level of innovation and completeness in the app world that we just don't have here. My Chinese friends come to the United States and feel like they're in a backwards society. They can, in China, you can order a pen, a computer, and a motorbike at 11 in the morning. And at 3 p.m. that day, it's going to arrive. Do the Chinese young people have an appetite for American products? Big time, but with a caveat. A lot of Western marketers sort of treat Chinese millennials that they're kind of like American millennials, but just over there. Different fashion sense a little bit. This young generation in China has a tremendous interest in our movies, TV shows, culture, music, fashion. 
uh, food, cars, top to bottom, really. But they want to be respected. And a big part of that respect means acknowledging their differences, understanding their tastes, coming from a place of understanding to give them something, a version of, of American products that will appeal specifically to them. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. So you've been mostly in China, but you've been back and forth and back and forth. Now you're living in Brooklyn, back and forth to China. Um, when you meet American business leaders or tech people, you get the feeling they've got a pretty deep understanding of China? No. What do they know, usually? What is it about China they know? Gosh, they know a exceptional version of China. So either they know chow mein, which, is, which isn't even Mandarin, by the way. I've literally talked to a tech, uh, you know, a CEO of a tech company in China. He had had a few drinks. I asked him what he this knows. Is it American? In America. I asked him what he knows about China, and he yells chow mein and then walks away. That was it. Uh, but most people see these sort of sensational stories that, rep, you know, sort of Maserati driving, dog eating, <laughs> ghost towns, but overpopulated subways, you know, these, these things that don't really add up. Uh, they're extraordinary. I focus on, in my book and, and with the work that I do, the ordinary in China, what, what it means to be young Chinese to the majority of people. Is it frustrating to you that... When you look at how much pe young people in China know about Americans, and then you look at how much Americans know about China, what goes on in your head? You asked if it's frustrating. It's so frustrating that I wrote an entire book <laughs> trying to China remedy the situation. It is frustrating. And I hope that be it, you know, if it's our competitive nature, it's, our, it's in the spirit of understanding that we aim to understand this young generation of China better because they are going to be influencing every corner of our world for the next 50 to 100 years. What kind of products? I mean, is it just if you're in the tech business or sodas? I mean, what are you, movies? Honestly, top to bottom. I mean, we've already seen how they're influencing the film world. If you, if you don't have a second opening in China, you won't get funded in Hollywood now. They're buying up movie theaters all throughout the United States. But then also things like the NBA, like Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors, he's like, the guy walks on water in China. I mean, do you see his images? He's, you know, he's, he's everywhere. Everywhere. You see his jersey everywhere. Steph, what's unique about him versus someone like LeBron is, you know, Steph kind of has a style of game that appeals to people in China. LeBron is a physical specimen. He's bigger, stronger, faster than everyone. Uh, if you're a young Chinese person, you can't, that doesn't really jive with you. You, you don't, you're not going to become LeBron. But Steph, they said he was too small. They said he wasn't fast enough. He wasn't skilled enough. Again, through hard work, discipline, rigor, through eating bitter, really, Steph became an NBA star. It's, it sort of is the Chinese story. Okay. It's hard not to look at China without filtering it through what we hold so dear in our country, our democracy, our freedom of speech, our freedom of the press, our voting. How do young people in China see, how do they see their government? effective not perfect but effective this young generation has spent time abroad they've traveled internationally two-thirds of all passport holders in all of china are under the age of 35 they've been around they know what democracy looks like one-third of all people studying abroad in the united states right now are from china so there's not like there's it's not like they've never seen they don't understand the other options but they look at some of our inefficiencies. They look at the way that it's hard for us to get things done. And they look back at their government. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Do they have complaints? Most definitely. But is it effective? Has it brought their family out of poverty? I mean, this is, this is quite real. It brought, China brought 500 million people out of poverty in the last, last several decades. So it's effective. How do they view our government? How do the young people in China view our government? Um, uh, uh, this is a sensitive question. It's a little sensitive question. It, uh, we have a candidate who ran and run on a platform that said our opposition and the establishment, they are corrupt officials with a fixed media. And if you think about what we say about China, corrupt officials with a fixed media, a lot of people in China are like, huh, you know, isn't that what you guys say about us? So the, a lot of people are thinking, you know, maybe all governments are bad in certain ways, but our government certainly gets a lot of things done. 
Any members of the Trump family particularly appealing in China? Yeah, Ivanka. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the nuance of a lot of what she says doesn't always, people don't always suss it out in China, but they see what they think to be an extremely attractive, extremely successful person who didn't rest on the laurels of her father, what appears to be an extremely successful father. You know, take from that what you will. And she also, her kids speak Chinese. So her daughter, who sings in Chinese, became a viral star in China because she sang, I don't remember what the song was, but she, she sang a song and it, and it blew up all over China. And she's savvy like that. The Trump family is savvy like that. A couple of more questions. And there's some questions. There's obviously a lot of questions coming in. Um, how is this Chinese government, let's assume that they're very calculated and they want the young generation to go from imitative to innovative, not an easy thing. How are they doing that? What's happening? Yeah, I, what I, I think you're right to say they're calculating. What I think is interesting about, it's sort of like the Chinese government, they sort of have a Chinese medicine approach to governance. Preventive, preventative care and preventive care is, is better than reactive. And because of their one party system, they're able to sort of do that. So they are letting people like me into the country. They are allowing foreign businesses to mingle. They're letting, they're putting a tremendous amount of students, they're sending them abroad to study, and then they're incentivizing them to come back. And How many of our students, what's the status of Chinese students? In One third of all people studying abroad in the United States right now are from China. And it's not just like a big numbers game. The next best represented country is India, but they're still only at one-tenth. It's a deliberate push. When China was becoming a manufacturing partner, or manufacturing power, they didn't, they never, they didn't have an industrial revolution. They didn't know how to manufacture. They invited the world's best manufacturers into their country. They copied the technology. They did it themselves. Now China needs to stimulate an innovation boom. They are encouraging their students to study abroad, to learn innovation from, quote unquote, the best innovators. They recognize that Chinese education does not necessarily create an innovator. It creates a memorizer. So they are looking for inspiration from everywhere and encouraging it. So, mom and I were very anxious that you were spending years in roaming the countryside on camels and mules and, and Mongolia and Tibet and backwoods. What was it like to be in a communist country? There's this expectation that China, there's like a big brother, big brother presence there. Not at all. In fact, most Westerners, when, they, when they're there, they feel like kind of more free than they've ever felt. Uh, there's not a sense that you're being watched by the government. It's often described as an anaconda in the chandelier. You know, this, this snake isn't coming down and, and pouncing on anyone. You're aware of its presence. So in terms of what you write, if you're going to publish something that's going to get an enormous amount of attention, that anaconda might come down. But just for daily life, for the experience there, it's, you know, young people feel relatively free, increasingly so. We think of freedom as freedom from an oppressive government. And so right. when I think, boy, I wouldn't want to live there because the government is oppressive. Is that the way people think, young people think of freedom? No. And this is a really important point. Freedom is on the minds and mouths of all of my friends in China. I've seen zio, freedom, tattooed on, on people's wrists, on people's backpacks, on people's clothing. It's everywhere. It's in advertisements. But the freedom people crave is not freedom from an oppressive, restrictive government, but rather freedom from an oppressive restrictive set of traditions. For women, the idea that if you're not married by 27 or 30, that you are socially inedible, that you're considered sheng nu, a leftover woman. What, what's the word? Leftover woman, sheng nu. So women are considered leftover if what? If they are not married by the age of, it used to be 27, now it's 30. But they're also being encouraged to get a master's degree, to get a professional degree. So you, you're in school until you're 25, and then you have about two months to date. And then you have to find a mate and settle down for life. That, you know, the, the contradictions of traditions, what it, means to, what it traditionally means to be Chinese, and the presses of modernity, they're like two tectonic plates. They grind against one another. And young China, this young generation, is at the fault line, deciding where those plates are going to fit together and what it means to be Chinese in the modern world. And freedom has a lot to do with being free of the pressures of, uh, of Chinese. They want to feel like they can live their life and do what they want, marry who they want, buy, or buy property or not, without having this tremendous family and culturally driven pressure. The pressure, you know, the freedom to vote, 
they look at America, I mean, they're 1.4 billion people. They're not thinking that that would really give them a voice. They look at America and half the people don't go to the polls. The freedom they want is a freedom to live the life that they see fit for themselves. A couple of, there's lots of questions coming in. So let me ask you a couple of questions that are coming in from people. Um, so we think of marketing, selling, mm -hmm. uh, Black Friday, Christmas holidays. What's the biggest sales activity in China? Is there an event? There's one holiday that we don't have here. It's, uh, it's called Singles Day, Shuang Shi. It now means double 11. Uh, Jack Ma of Alibaba. Double 11 meaning? It's on November 11th of every year. Jack Ma of Alibaba fame basically created this holiday and it's driven, whereas Valentine's Day is driven for couples, letting them celebrate what they want, Double Eleven and Singles Day was created to help single people get what they, or, or try to get what they want versus celebrate what they actually have. So people buy from Alibaba and Taobao, which is sort of like Amazon, en masse. Their last year of sales was three times as much as Black Friday uh, and Cyber Monday combined. In it's one day? In one day. It's the largest single expenditure, single day expenditure holiday in the world by an enormous margin. Couple of questions before we wrap up and I'll tell everybody again how to find more about your book and you. Um, with a crackdown on Western companies in China, mm -hmm. um, how do American businesses, I'm not talking about individuals, businesses right. do a better job of relating to the, within the Chinese marketplace? It's a great question. China acts in self-interest dependably, be it politics or economics. So if you are thinking you're going to walk in with your company and take the money and run without having a Chinese partner, without uh, putting that money back into the Chinese economy, China's not interested in that sort of growth. You know, we talk about America first. China was the first, my country first nation. If you're not benefiting China, if you're not helping China become a more innovative com a country, if you're not helping in their transition, they're not interested in doing business with you. There's enormous am amount of opportunities for partnerships. Uh, and there's enormous amount of opportunities for cooperation. Going in and trying to gut it out on your own, it's real tough. Last question before I tie this up and, and throw my last thought at you. Um, to what extent are young people in China driven by doing good versus getting ahead or making money or even caring for their parents? It's a really good question. If you were to ask people five years ago, what's the religion in China? We think of a religion as being a moral compass often not always that way, but often, uh, people would sarcastically say, money. What do, you, what do you believe in? Money. As a reaction to that capitalist push, this young generation has, they're still success driven. They're still get ahead driven. Again, it's sort of this rags to riches mentality. Uh, everyone in China is new money. But this young generation is starting to realize that that's not enough. There is a, a spirituality and a, and a want for more than just, in, you know, the men in China say, my fang, my chur, sheng hai zi jiu si. It means buy an apartment, buy a car, have kids, then die. Those are seen as the markers of success. The first three happen before you're 30, and then you just kind of like sit on your thumbs for the, next, uh, for the next 40 years of your life. Doing good and creating a sense of purpose outside of money is becoming an increasingly large priority for this young generation, different than their parents. Let me say one thing. Uh, first, this whole uh, discussion is being recorded, and a transcript and copy of video and audio of it will be available for folks tomorrow. Zach, your website is youngchinagroup.com. The book is Young China, How the Restless Generation Will Change Their Country and the World. And so I'm going to ask you one last question and before we close out. Um, Four hundred plus million young people in a country that's experienced unprecedented capitalistic success, growth, modernization. What's your hope that's going to come from your work with this book and your company? And does China have everything figured out? Do they just know exactly where they're heading into the future? It's a good question. I'll take them one at a time. So my hope like I said earlier, is to build understanding. I truly feel that there's a gulf of understanding between our two countries. And not just a gulf of understanding, but an intention to understand. It's my opinion that if 
that China is going to be the largest trend in, in the 21st century, period. And this young generation is deciding what it means to be Chinese in the modern world. It's the first generation to get to do that in the history of China. So to understand that, to come from a place of understanding for business, economics, policy, and then personal relationships, I'm committed to, to that bridge work. I really am. And does China have it all figured out? So I said earlier that they're able to be preventive. They're able to be sort of predictive. Uh, they create five-year plans every year, and they do their best to navigate the, the shoals of the future, the rocky, you know, the, the, the difficult path ahead. But the, the line that used to be described, that Deng Xiaoping used to describe the modernization process of China is It means crossing the river by feeling the stones, which is a beautiful way of saying that we don't know where the heck we're going. We are eyes closed in the rushing river of time and history, groping with one foot, trying to find a, a solid piece of land to put, your, to put your feet on, to shift your weight. It also, by the way, is an acknowledgment that to the left, there is one way of governance, Western democracy. To the right, there's another way of governance, communism in the way that we think about it, you know, Soviet style. And they looked at both of those options, and they chose a third way. They went through the middle. They are crossing the river by feeling the stones in uncharted territory, doing something that no government or group of people have ever tried to do.